This video is going to be a little bit different from the other videos which focus on geopolitical and military matters. I want to talk about a disturbing trend that I am seeing not only in the Ukraine conflict, but in the world as a whole. As the world is headed towards a new Cold War, in which all the indications are that this one is going to be a lot more bitter and hostile than the previous Cold War, we are seeing many countries people and communities begin to crack down on freedom of speech. Today, April 20th, 2022, has been a horrific day for freedom of speech and journalism. The most notable thing that has happened today that has reached world headlines is Britain's decision to go through with the extradition of WikiLeaks founder and journalist Julian Assange to the United States. Julian Assange, for those who do not know, has been accused of essentially spying against the United States. And the reason that he has been accused of this is because he revealed American war crimes in Iraq and in Afghanistan to the world. And if you don't know what I am talking about, you can look up the documentary Collateral Murder. There is a lot of discussion about it and has been over the last 10 years. Of course, nobody who was responsible for the events described in the documentary Collateral Murder has ever been and likely will never be charged for committing war crimes and crimes against humanity. However, Julian Assange, who is neither a U.S. citizen nor was on U.S. soil when committing these alleged crimes, the crimes of revealing America's legitimate war crimes to the world, is now being extradited to the United States, where all indications are that he will serve a life sentence. The many charges which are levied against him carry a prison sentence of 175 years. All of this for essentially doing journalism. And Julian Assange's sentence will not be served in any kind of humane facility. It will, most likely, be served in a special administrative measures unit, Without going into too many details, these special administrative measures units are more of the same of what he has already served in Belmarsh Prison, which is the maximum security prison in the United Kingdom, where he has been held for over three years now for skipping bail. The bail for what was already back then a clearly kangaroo court hearing where he was supposed to be extradited to the United States. Suffice it to say that all legal, moral, and human norms have been broken time and time again in Julian Assange's case. The man's physical and mental health has deteriorated severely after being holed up first in the Ecuadorian embassy for five years and then in solitary confinement in a maximum security prison, which is Belmarsh Prison, for over three more years. And I hate to say this, but life imprisonment is probably the best that Julian Assange can now hope for. The worst being that he is simply suicided, epstein if you will, while on United States territory. And this is something that various US politicians have pretty much openly talked about. There have been public proposals in the United States proposed by various U.S. government officials, senators, members of Congress, to impose the capital punishment on Julian Assange to carry out a death sentence on someone who is not a U.S. citizen for the crime of doing journalism. And in the interest of fairness, I should note that the U.S. has made a verbal promise that they won't do this, that they will not execute Julian Assange. But frankly, I would not bet my life on a verbal promise of the United States government, especially since the United States government has a history of breaking these kinds of verbal promises. Some people are calling this the final nail in the coffin for freedom of speech in the West. Some others still believe that there is a little bit of hope since Julian Assange has not been physically extradited yet and, legally speaking, Julian Assange's defense still has a few weeks in which it can file complaints to oppose this extradition. But realistically speaking, this battle for freedom of speech in the West 
was lost a very long time ago. It was lost long before Julian Assange was seized from the Ecuadorian embassy in London and long before he sought asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy in the first place. Freedom of speech in the West is an illusion, and it is not even a well-woven illusion. The oligarch class, which controls Western politics, has firmly established itself and has been acting this way for, at the very least, several decades. Unfortunately, Julian Assange has made himself a target when he exposed the many war crimes of the United States in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he made even more enemies when WikiLeaks was involved in exposing and publishing the leaked emails from Hillary Clinton's server. If the US oligarch class is out to get you, then there are very few places in the world which are actually safe. The United Kingdom is, of course, not one of them. Anyone who finds themselves in Julian Assange's shoes, one such individual, by the way, is Edward Snowden, can hope to find political asylum in either Russia or China. I'm not saying that there aren't other countries around the world which could accept political asylum seekers who are on the hit list of Western governments, but the two big world superpowers that oppose the collective West are likely the safest bet. Unfortunately, unlike Edward Snowden, Julian Assange was not in either of these countries when the political witch hunt against him started, so he never really had a chance, unfortunately. The second case that I wanted to talk about today has something to do with Ukraine, and it is about a famous blogger. Some of you may have heard the name Gonzalo Lira. He is a Chilean citizen who was in Ukraine when the war started. Gonzalo Lira has lived in Ukraine for several years, and perhaps the most notable thing about him was that even as he was on Ukrainian territory, in territory that was held by the ruling Ukrainian government, even as he resided in the Ukrainian city of Kharkov, he was extremely outspoken against the Zelensky administration and against the overall political orientation of post-Maidan Ukraine. And this is where the media outlet that is known as the Daily Beast comes into play. The Daily Beast is an American, essentially tabloid, it's an American tabloid. One of this tabloid's staff members wrote essentially a smear piece on Gonzalo Lira. I am going to post that smear piece in the comments. I encourage you all to read it if you have the nerves and endurance to do so. It is something out of this world. It is 20 plus pages of something that feels like it was written by a Redditor. Just an incredibly long string of sentences pouring more and more dirt on Gonzalo Lira, calling him a Putin puppet, a propagandist, all of the bad words under the sun. And I cannot stress this fact enough. The language, the tone of this so-called article feels like it was written by the ultimate neckbeard Redditor. Anyways, Gonzalo Lira reacted to this hit piece, and you can watch his reaction on his channel where he exposes some very disturbing things about this article. The article in question essentially admits to the fact that the staff members of the Daily Beast contacted the Zelensky government and told them about Gonzalo Lira. They told him that he is a blogger who is located in Kharkov. They admitted to the fact that they already knew that the Ukrainian secret services, which are called the SBU, have already tried to seek him out and that Gonzalo Lira believes that they were trying to disappear him. Something which, by the way, in Ukraine has plenty of precedence. And again, I encourage you to listen to Gonzalo Lira's own video on this matter. You can find it on his channel, which is still up there on YouTube. But essentially, Gonzalo Lira accuses the journalists, so-called journalists that work for the Daily Beast, of bringing unwanted attention to him and revealing some of his whereabouts while knowing that he is a targeted man. And in that video, Gonzalo Lira made a warning. He said that 
if he was ever gone for more than 12 hours, then everybody should assume that he has been disappeared by the SBU, that he has been disappeared by the Ukrainian Secret Service. And indeed, Gonzalo Lira went missing on April 15th. April 15th was the last time that anybody had heard from him. And this is where we arrive at two conclusions. There are only two conclusions that can be drawn from this. Either Gonzalo Lira staged his own disappearance, or he was disappeared by the Ukrainian Secret Service as he feared he might be. Many fear that Gonzalo Lira is dead. I should emphasize that nobody has definitive proof that this is the case. I sincerely hope that this is not the case and that Gonzalo Lira will reappear any day now. But the evidence that we have says that this will almost certainly not happen. On Twitter, members of the Azov Battalion posted a very disturbing picture in response to a post that asked about Gonzalo Lira's whereabouts and requested that anybody who knows where he is come forth. And the picture is that of members of the Azov Battalion smiling at the camera as one of the men flexes his arm with the caption, if anybody knows where Gonzalo Lira is, please make a single bicep pose. Essentially implicitly stating that they are behind his disappearance. And as of today, April 20th, Scott Ritter, who is a former US Marine, UN weapons inspector, and a personality that has been very active in the media sphere around the Ukraine war, has made a post on Telegram essentially announcing that Gonzalo Lira is dead. According to Scott Ritter, Gonzalo Lira has been murdered by the Kraken unit of the Azov Battalion, which is affiliated with the SPU. I should stress that this is what Scott Ritter is saying, I do not know where Scott Ritter got this information from, and I sincerely hope that he is wrong on this matter. However, Scott Ritter has his sources, and he is not one to peddle rumors. So, if all of this is correct, the only conclusion that can be drawn from this is that the Ukrainian regime has just sent neo-Nazis to murder a blogger, to murder somebody who spoke out against them. But perhaps the thing that I find most disturbing about all of this is not only are people keeping quiet about this, not only are the usual media outlets and blue check marks on Twitter who cry about human rights abuses in other countries keeping silent about the murder of a blogger who was killed by neo-Nazis for wrong speak. Some people on Reddit, on Twitter, are actually supporting this. They are cheering it and hoping that this is the case. In other words, they fully support the brutal murder of people who exercise their free speech if that murder is committed by countries and by regimes which are allied to the collective West. For Gonzalo Lira, there is a small, a tiny ray of hope that he is still out there somewhere, that he is still alive. The same, unfortunately, cannot be said for Vladimir Kuleshov, who is a Ukrainian blogger from the city of Kherson, who was murdered in his car outside his apartment out of suspicions that he might hold pro-Russian views. Now, I will be honest, unlike all of the other people that I am covering in this video, Today was the first time that I heard about this individual. I have not been following his blogs or any of his channels. But he is apparently a famous blogger in Ukraine, and he was found dead in his car today on April 20th. Somebody had shot him dead. The windows on his car have multiple bullet holes. And the disturbing fact is that Kherson is a city which is controlled by Russian forces. So the evidence points towards the fact that there is some sort of underground cell of either the Ukrainian Secret Service or some other radical pro-Ukrainian organization which is hunting down and murdering people in the city of Kherson who hold pro-Russian opinions. And one final case that I want to talk about is about another blogger who fortunately is not dead, but has been nonetheless detained by another pro-Western regime, 
because of some things that he said concerning the war in Ukraine and the pro-Russian stance that he took. Four weeks ago, on March 22nd, a Russian-language blogger and YouTuber named Kirill Fedorov, who was and still is legally a citizen of Latvia, was arrested by Latvian authorities upon trying to leave the country. He has ever since been in detention, apparently in solitary confinement. Very little contact was made with Kirill ever since he was arrested by Latvian authorities. Kirill has formally not been charged with anything. There has, as of now, been no trial in his case. Some reports suggested that Latvian authorities were trying to charge him with incitement of ethnic hatred and support for genocide. However, given the fact that Kirill Fedorov's YouTube content was apolitical, that is to say it did not delve into morality or politics, it was a channel that simply reported on the course of the war, on the course of battles as they occurred and discussed various military matters and developments from all over the world in a manner that was fairly removed from politics. This claim that Kirill was inciting ethnic hatred and justifying genocide was so absurd that Latvian authorities were ultimately not able to charge him with anything. Keep in mind that Kirill was arrested long before any stories about what may or may not have happened in Bucha came out. He was arrested and publicly disappeared within the first weeks of the war as he was trying to leave Latvia forever and move to Russia after he had reportedly received numerous threats which stated that he might be detained and disappeared in the exact manner that he was. Kirill Fedorov was a pretty big YouTuber in the Russian-speaking internet. His channel had several hundred thousand subscribers, and his Telegram channel is still being run by his friends and associates, whereas his YouTube channel has been replaced by the channel of one of his friends who is continuing his work. In the West, hardly anybody knows about him. Hardly anybody knows anything about this individual or his story. But in the Russian-speaking world, he was and still is a pretty significant personality. And when news of his disappearance, his arrest, came out, the Russian-speaking world was outraged. People in Russia held rallies, demanding that Latvian authorities release Kirill from custody. The Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson, Maria Zaharova, has even made a public statement, demanding that Latvian authorities release Kirill. But of course, none of this has ever happened, and unfortunately, I do not expect that it will happen anytime soon. As a result, we have a Russian-speaking YouTuber who is in a Latvian prison, in solitary confinement, in indefinite detention, for making YouTube videos in which he refuted the idea that the Russian military is losing the war, and for refusing to condemn Russia's actions in the war. Basically, the same things that I am doing on this channel as well. Actually, a lot less than what I am doing, because on my channel I do talk about politics, and I often talk about various political figures and mainstream media in a very scathing tone. This is something that Kirill objectively did not do. Fortunately, I live in a free country where I will not go to prison for exercising my right to free speech. But Latvia, on the other hand, is not a free country. Latvia, like all of the Baltic states, and like all of the Western-aligned countries throughout the world, holds freedom of speech in exactly the same regard as the people who are pursuing the political witch hunt against Julian Assange and are justifying the murder of Gonzalo Lira. Freedom of speech in the Western world is an illusion. It may have been something that existed to some extent in the first Cold War, when there was some modicum of respect between the great powers and adversaries of the world. However, the world today is very different from 50 years ago. Today, there is no respect, there is no honor, there is no such thing as freedom of speech. Countries are fighting dirty. They are breaking every law, every morality that they can 
as long as it gives them some small perceived advantage. The political class of the West has decayed immensely over the last 50 years, and these are the consequences. April 20th has been an absolutely terrible day for freedom of speech throughout the world. We have had the rubber stamping of the extradition of one world-famous journalist who will now face life imprisonment for the crime of doing journalism, and we've received news of the murder of two bloggers in Ukraine who were suspected of being unsupportive of the foreign-controlled regime which rules this country. Unfortunately, every day freedom of speech is becoming an increasingly rare thing. And that is the reason why in every one of my videos I tell everybody to please check out my channels on Rumble and on Telegram. These are platforms that have no political censorship whatsoever. There are precedents of people being permanently removed from YouTube without warning for wrong thing. I hope that I will not be the next target, but I am making backup channels on other platforms exactly for this reason. So if you are watching this video on YouTube, the link to my Rumble channel and to my Telegram channel will be in the video description. Please do check them out. And if you are watching this on Rumble, then the link in the video description will be to my YouTube channel and to my Telegram channel respectively. Please be sure to check those out as well. With that said, I thank you for watching this video. Please be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this video. It helps the algorithm to recommend this video to more people, ensuring that more people will see it. That is all that I have to say for today. Once again, thank you for watching this video, and I hope that you have a wonderful day.